electron configuration gives us insight into the idea that the periodic table is really organized into blocks based on the subshell, the type of subshell that's filling in that block. So the main group elements, for example, are those whose last valence electron just went into an s orbital or a p orbital, and that's groups 1, 2, and 13 through 18. The transition metals are those whose last valence electron, roughly speaking, is in a d orbital in the middle of the periodic table, and that's groups 3 through 12. The inner transition metals, which are sort of inside the transition metals in a way, are the lanthanides and actinides, and in these atoms, the last valence electron, quote unquote, is in an f orbital, roughly speaking. So there's an electronic similarity between atoms in the same group of the periodic table in that they're all filling the same subshell. And this provides a lot of the similarity and the periodicity in the nature of elemental properties that we'll encounter in the last section of this series. Let's write the electron configuration for phosphorus, which has the atomic number 15. I've gone ahead and listed our atomic orbital scaffold up through the 3p orbitals since 15 is going to get us up there to the 3p subshell, and p in square brackets here just indicates we're going to fill the electron configuration in textual form out over here. So let's start and recognize that since we've got an atomic number of 15. I've got 15 electrons to deal with in the neutral atom, so we're going to keep track of how many electrons we've dealt with as we fill the orbitals from the bottom up in accordance with the Aufbau principles. So let's do it. Starting with the 1s level, we put two electrons there, one spin up and one spin down. We've accounted for two electrons. I then add two more electrons to the 2s subshell, and now I've used four electrons total. I start filling the 2p subshell, got six electrons in there, and I've now used a total of 10, and I add two more electrons to the 3s subshell, and now I'm up to a total of 12. I've got three electrons left, and those are all gonna go in the 3p subshell. The way they go in must be in accordance with Hund's rule, with parallel spins, one electron each in each of those orbitals in the 3p subshell, that's just Hun's rule in action. And there it is. This is the electron configuration of neutral phosphorus. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. And what we've built out on the right-hand side here is an orbital energy diagram showing the occupancy and rough relative energies of the orbitals in their various subshells. Finally, let's say a few words about cations and anions. For the main group elements, cations of the main group metals in group 1 and 2 of the periodic table, we simply remove the last electron that we added. We walk to the left for each positive charge. So one spot to the left for a plus 1 charge, two spots to the left for a plus 2 charge. The configuration of the element at that position is the configuration of that corresponding cation. I'm going to jump down to configurations of anions of the main group elements where the basic idea is very similar. We walk to the right on the periodic table the number of steps corresponding to the magnitude of the charge. So minus one, we walk one step to the right. Minus two, we walk two steps to the right. And the configuration of the element at that position is the configuration of the corresponding anion. As you practice with this, the thing you'll realize is that most cations and anions of main group elements have electron configurations that correspond to the configuration of the closest noble gas with a completely full valence shell. And there's a good reason for that. Elements and atoms tend to want to obtain those full valence shell configurations to form relatively stable cations and anions. The transition metals are a little bit different and a little bit complicated because of this issue of the number of electrons and the exact occupancy of the subshells affecting the relative energies of the S and D subshells. The way they work is we lose the S electrons first. So we take out, for example, for a plus three ion, both four S electrons first and then one of the three D electrons. And so we lose those S electrons and we also lose the corresponding number of D electrons based on the charge of the ion. And in fact, even for a plus one transition metal cation, we lose both S electrons and throw any that remaining electron in a D orbital uh, to account for the plus one charge.